Hello and welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. Hi, I'm Larry. I'm Sarah. And I'm Josh. It is very nice that, Sarah, you are back on the panel with us for the first time since season 11. Welcome it's, back, Sarah. It is great to have Thanks. you back because we always, we always enjoy having you on board. Thanks. That was You're always thing. very charming and happy and pleasant. Thank you. You guys as well. So uh, today we're going to be going over a history about a color. And in particular, we're going to be going over red the History of a Color by Michel Pastoreau. And the discussion starter that I have for this particular book is, Read the History of a Color is part of a series written by Pastoreau, who is a French historian specializing in colors, symbols, and heraldry. He has written about the colors black, blue, green, and yellow, as well as a history about stripes. Ranging from before the Common Era until recent times, Pastor Root touches upon what he feels he is able to on this particular subject matter. Do you believe he covers enough ground on teaching us about the color red? Is the inevitable overlapping about general color history necessary? I mean, when I look at this and I say that uh, it's like just like kind of like a nice book, like a coffee table kind of book. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not it's not necessary, but, you know, like just to have it there. With, you know, it's got real nice, pretty pictures in it and little excerpts that you can just kind of like thumb through and read or have out for guests to like just kind of look at and enjoy. I think that, you know, as that goes, I think it's very good. You know what I mean? But like as far as like a deep history into, into a color, is it sufficient? Yeah. I, 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 who could say? I would disagree that it would, I think that it is necessary. I think that anything that needs to be covered is necessary. And I think that people would be interested to learn about the color, about colors and their history, and in this case, the color red. And I think that it's very well organized and very rich. However, I think that when it comes to covering the entire ground, there were aspects that were engaging, some that were a bit challenging. I think that it could have touched upon a little bit more, and I think that it could have been more complete. It's tough when it comes, because when you're talking about one color, you have to put it on the, the same landscape as every other color. And so there are things that you're going to keep repeating. I think that he did what he could. If he really wanted to expand, he could have gone beyond Europe. I don't have a lot to compare it to in terms of I haven't really read much art history sort of books. I think I've read like one or two art related books. I thought it felt complete to me in terms of I thought it was like a good 200 page overview of the history of the color red. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting because when you talk about the history of a color considering the entire history of the world there's so much that I, I would think that you could write. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I got a pretty good intro to from how um, the Catholic priests had used it in like olden times to the Reformation to the French Revolution to mm -hmm. makeup to all these things. So I felt like it gave a good intro I suppose you could add so, so much more, but I guess if you're mm -hmm. trying to bring people in to learn about the history of a color and how much complexity and depth it has, you would have to start somewhere. But mm -hmm. I also tend to like things, so I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I think if you're into religious history, I think mm -hmm. that it really touches upon the influence of uh, Christianity and its many forms within Europe, uh, because you start out with Catholicism, but then because of the uh, Protestant Rep Reformation and Protestantism, Anglicanism, Calvinism, Lutheranism, they took on more subtle and not as standout colors. They preferred black, white, gray, brown as opposed to stronger colors like red. Back in the day, this book denotes that red was the popular color. You had black and white were your traditionals, and then red, that meant flashy. Trace, it was very vague when it came to tracing back, but then again, back in the day, it would be what a plant could offer would determine the color, right. as opposed to now we can pretty much synthesize. synthesize and create anything that we want. Crayola is the master of that. Mm -hmm. Through this, you also learn more about history in general, mm -hmm. especially, I think, one thing that made me think of you is uh, as far as the, the Catholic tradition of the blood of Christ and how at a certain point going into, I would say about seven, eight, nine centuries ago, they decided the only ones that would consistently drink the blood of Christ were priests and members of clergy as opposed to the general people where I pointed out that it contradicted what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. Well, you know, I mean, the, the church has the authority to to make these kinds of decisions. That's their authority because we believe that God speaks through the church. It is important to remember that you know the Eucharist is, is both uh, the body and the blood mm -hmm. and both the, 
the, the host and the and the uh, mm -hmm. the goblet are both right. Like mm -hmm. one is wine, which is more representative of blood, mm -hmm. and the bread is more representative of flesh. But they do mm -hmm. contain both. He is fully present. Christ is fully present mm -hmm. in both. It's a matter of uh, avoiding spills and things like that because mm -hmm. these substances are so sacred that you don't want to spill anything and you have to be very careful. If you drop mm -hmm. a host, it's a big thing, you know, everybody's got to stand back and the priest has got to make sure it's properly disposed of and so, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of convenience and because you the, uh, the church has the ability to conduct certain uh, aspects of, of the faith with, with authority, they can make those kinds of decisions. It's not really a contradiction. Depending on what the reason was. If it was a reason within goodwill, I think that that's one thing, but if it was, if it was, if the reason was we need to save money, that should only be a template, for example. if any. Well, I don't know what the reason was. Yeah. A book like this would make me more interested to read up on, uh, because this pro this only touched upon what was relevant to the subject of the color red, because it did touch upon the blood of Christ. And we see that in the blood of Christ in the Catholic Church, you know, as far as using red to represent that, and not just Christ too, but also the blood of the martyrs, like that's. Mm -hmm. That's why the Pope wears red shoes. He mm -hmm. is kind of standing in the blood of the martyrs, symbolically there. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where it is because the martyrs were willing to die for Christ that gets to be the Pope. Mm -hmm. It's like the symbology. And then the, the bishops, they wear red hats as well for the same mm -hmm. reason to represent the blood of the martyrs. Yes, you know, right in, in, in Catholicism. Or, yes. Eventually, so, though, they, it got to the point where it was uh, red became more of a satanic and a sinful color. Judas's hair would be depicted as being red. Hmm. Interesting, too, right? Because historically, Judas was Middle Eastern and hmm. wouldn't have had red hair unless I'm missing all, something. All of them were right? Middle Eastern. Yes, I remember looking at the picture and there's a yeah. lot of red-headed men, and I was like, but they're not Irish or Scottish or European. Yeah, that's, I don't I mean, know, <laughs> because in the Bible, um, who is it, Jacob's brother, uh, I forget the name of Jacob's brother. Oh, Esau. Was red hair. Yeah. I did read that and I didn't recall, so that was interesting. That's the, the impact of what art has mm -hmm. on society. Yeah, that's why blue overtook red was the Virgin Mary used to be depicted in a wide variety of colors, but more mm -hmm. so, they were more subtle colors, sometimes mm -hmm. red. Around the year 1000, they started depicting her in blue and it became a lighter blue. That started to have a reflection on the kings of the societies. Mm -hmm. Blue attire became more fashionable. I mean, as the years went on, blue has consistently become the most popular color from that point, which in that case, that makes you want to read blue, the mm -hmm. history of a color. Yeah, and that to me, right, that represents like the purity of, of the that's, yes. that's, what the, that's why they would go with blue with the Virgin Mary that represents her purity. But yeah, that's how they started to define it as her purity, was when they started painting her in blue attire. Right. It was interesting on the subject of blue, within the context of red, the part that talked about, I don't remember exactly which shift it was going on, but after they wanted to pull back from red, maybe during the Reformation, the Luther and the other man with an M that I can't recall, and it talked about, they liked something about not depicting the creator but only creation and they they shied away from red and instead to the blue and green colors because mm -hmm. it was more based off of the earth tones and they thought it was I don't know if it was more subtle or more something and just that interesting concept of colors are theoretically outside of our like social cultural spiritual like they just exist outside of us but all the things that we meaning oh yeah it was right there the it meaning we attribute to colors. Philip uh, Malacom? Yeah, I, actually, I never heard of him. Sorry, Philip Malacom. Yeah. Yeah. sure you were a splendid yeah. fellow. I think he's a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Philosopher. I thought it was interesting. And even just the contrast of Rembrandt, who I was vaguely familiar with, and another artist, and one was a Calvinist, and he did use red, but the other one was a something, and he didn't. Some type of concept, and I found it so interesting, because theoretically red is just a color, but the meaning we attribute to it, it was just so fascinating and what was popular and mm -hmm. from the church and the government standpoint. Right. And I, we, I was actually talking with my partner about Van Gogh and we were saying how interesting, like if Van Gogh was born another time, like would he have been Van Gogh? Like would he have had that freedom to use blue mm -hmm. and yellow and green? Mm -hmm. And like if he was in a different time, like what would his art have looked like? Mm -hmm. Van yes. Gogh found happiness in the color yellow though, mm -hmm. because he ate yellow paint. Oh, he ate yellow paint? He ate yellow paint because he thought it would make him happy. Oh, I hadn't heard that. I heard in the quote where they said something like, there is no yellow without blue and green, which I thought was a nice reference mm -hmm. to the difference. But I hadn't heard the yellow paint thing. They have the structure of the uh, primary colors, the secondary colors throughout mm -hmm. history because it had changed throughout time until we get to now where red, yellow, blue are primary colors, mm -hmm. orange, green, purple are secondary. Black is a mix of everything. White is a mix of none. 
I'm not sure where that puts brown and gray. Me neither. Do more research on that. There's probably an answer out there. The, the triad of the red, white, black was something I wasn't familiar with, and the part where they referenced yeah. Little Red Riding Hood and a couple of those folk tales being centered on that yeah. triad of those colors. I think in the modern world, I always think of yellow, blue, and red because it's like classic second grade art class. That was yeah, that was that was interesting. How they devoted a whole chapter to Little Red Riding Hood. They did <laughs> makes sense because that story red. changed all the time depending on who was telling the tale. Right. But yeah, I remember those art classes where red and green, orange and blue, and purple, yellow mm -hmm. and purple are partnered up, and then the hot colors and the cold colors, which is red, orange, yellow is hot, and green, blue, purple is cold. And we did an art project based off of that, too. Our modern understanding of colors from, I would guess, like a pure artistic visual standpoint mm -hmm. versus red as like a, almost like a whole person of its own with history. I just want to emphasize what I said at the beginning. Like a minute ago, you guys, when Josh is kind of thumbing through the book and you're like pointing mm -hmm. out that, like that, to me, that's what this book is like perfect yeah. for. Like, I agree 110% because there, there's going to be the subject that may interest you. You get right to that point. The mm -hmm. only downside is while there is a table of contents, there is no index or glossary in the back. I wouldn't have been able to look up Martin Luther's name and go to that page. I would have to thumb through the book and yeah. wait to land Find on it. Yeah. yeah, but you know, that's like I said, you know, the book's designed to be thumbed through. It's, uh, yes. it's what it is. It's like, it feels like you're just supposed to kind of like pick it off and say, oh, wow, look at that. That's a real interesting image. And then mm -hmm. let me read about that image and see what, you know. Pictures. Yeah. I think Pastor Rue's greater intention was using this in an art history class because it was, it was published from Princeton University's press. I also think that he'd be pleased with just anybody picking up the book for whatever given reason, reading it as a reference book. And there's a lot of books that are that way, and that's a good thing. That would be the methodology to abide by. And it's not just old and religious times. You also have modern examples, too. Politics. Yeah, there's discussion of politics and parties within history. Mm -hmm. There's use in flags. Yes. Yeah use in culture. The one about World War One, where the French infantry was, uh, they would they wore red pants because that was what was back, uh, back in the day, that was what your uh, fighters would wear. However, it was obviously brought down by the fact that the German army was able to find them very easily with that flashy look in red. Yeah. I'd say that the chapter on painting is, is probably my favorite. I just thought the images that he picked for, for that part of the book were, every one of them was just very interesting. So you just want to know more about this piece and that piece and stuff. That, that's what I really mm -hmm. was gravitated toward that part. I would say that was probably the downside was that there wasn't any, I mean, the things that I mentioned were things that stuck out, but nothing made me say that this was so important that it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. But I think that it, as we were saying, it's something that we can refer back to. And that's probably where it excels the best. Yeah. Have any final thoughts? To piggyback off what both of you were saying, I was actually reading it and discussing it with the person I was with, and I was surprised because at first when I heard the title of this book, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read a book about the history of a color. This is not my norm. I normally like fiction, but I was really glad for it because as I was going through it, yeah. I was really surprised at how much comes up when it's just talking about a color that is so, I don't know, enlightening about so many parts about the human condition and culture yeah. and spirituality, and as time mm -hmm. evolved from like yeah. how women would put rouge or color on their face and intake like lead or mercury to adapt their skin and how pink was used by the French and all these interesting little things that are just so fascinating as it comes to being a human and mm -hmm. how just understanding a color and how it's changed over so long is like a good way to start to say oh this is interesting and this and this and this and like the conversations <laughs> it makes and even yeah. as like a coffee table piece if you're reading something like I was talking about how the color changed from the possible corruption at the time of when sometimes there's some corruption with old old Catholicism to the Reformation and those changes and, and the person I was with was talking about like the I forget the Byzantine the Brigantine Empire and like the way that power was getting dispersed and how color was doing this but it could have been under a bigger umbrella of like how power yeah. was changing mm -hmm. and it just I feel like it adds so much depth to life mm. and it's interesting and it's fun for conversation because everyone might have a different idea yeah I think that there's a lot that, that can be picked out of it how would we rate this zero to five stars half stars permitted Larry I'm going to go for uh, three and a half and the reason that I gave it a three and a half is because of the fact that I think that it is a perfect book just to have on your coffee table. Uh, Josh was saying, you know, you're not going to get too much depth. To me, that's uh, that serves the book well because of the fact that it would just be something that I would have out for people to just kind of like thumb through and stuff like that. So that's that's where I come at it. I think give it a four point 
0.75 because my interpretation of its goal to be a book that really goes over a long period of time and talks about how the color red has grown and evolved and meant different things. I guess there probably would be other parts you could add, but theoretically that book would be a thousand pages. So I feel like as an introduction to understanding the color, as an introduction to kind of understanding anything, I think it's fun and surprisingly intriguing no matter where you come from and what you might relate to. A good coffee table book to get people thinking about stuff outside of their like modern understanding of things. I'm going to give it a three and a half as well uh, because I, I seem to reflect Larry a little bit more on the basis that this is perfect as a reference piece and it's perfect to learn more if you're interested in looking at it from a certain perspective and it's interesting to just look, uh, open it up and read the particular area that you're looking to learn more about. It doesn't necessarily go uh, very much in depth and probably doesn't cover all of the ground that it could. Pastoru admits that, however, based off of the reading experience and what I got out of it, and reading it the first time and being someone that's reading it to review and discuss, that reading it the complete uh, the full Monty makes sense. On other occasions, I think if I had a question about a certain subject, I, the way I'd be revisiting it is in pieces. If you're interested in picking up Red, The History of a Color, here is my copy. Pastoru also wrote about the colors black, blue, green, yellow, and he wrote about stripes as well. If he comes out with anything else, hopefully he does, I hope he covers at least the major colors. I think his next one would be about the color white because he primarily bases as his major six colors, uh, red, blue, green, yellow, black, and white. As it says in his bio, he's, his interests are colors, symbology, and heraldry. He can touch upon any of those and be good. Be sure to join us next time on another episode of The Ray Gladiators. For now, keep reading. Hi there, this is Josh, and on the next episode of The Ray Gladiators, Larry, Cindy, Sarah, and I will be discussing Napoleon in Exile by Daniel Retz, featured in Outstanding Short Plays, Volume 3, edited by Greg Pospisil. If you like what you see on this channel, please support us on our Patreon, for the money that we make will allow us to provide you, the viewer, with even more great content. Thank you, and for now, keep reading.